I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Jeffrey. I'm the director of the Australia India Institute. I'd like to wish everyone a, a good afternoon, a, a good morning, a good evening. I think we have to cover all bases because we have a very international audience today for what I know is going to be an absolutely superb uh, presentation and um, Q&A session in front of us. I'd like to start by acknowledging that many of us are meeting on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who've been custodians of this land for many thousands of years. I acknowledge and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to thank Dr. Dolly Kikon for conceiving of this afternoon's event and uh, giving us this wonderful opportunity to celebrate the work of Richard Grove. It's also an honor to be able to welcome to this event, uh, Professor Mahesh Rangarajan, who's joining us from Delhi this afternoon. I'd also like to thank uh, Simone Traglia from the Australia India Institute for all her organizational help in arranging the, the Zoom today. I know that to some, ex to, to some extent, events are much easier in the current climate of online events, but I know it's, a, it's considerable work, so we're very grateful to the team at the Institute for, for all their work and Simone. I'd like now to hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Dolly Kikon, to chair today's event. Uh, but before I do so, I'd like to uh, say that uh, Dolly Kikon, who many of you will know, is a senior lecturer in anthropology and development studies at the University of Melbourne and someone who conducts research on a wide range of, of issues, many of which intersect with the work of Richard Grove. So particularly around topics such as the political economy of extractive resources, around migration, marginalization, gender relations, uh, food, uh, and human rights, particularly in relation to India, but all topics that she discusses in ways that have much larger global implications for our understanding of a range of key social topics. So it's a delight to be able to welcome Dolly, who is also a senior research associate at the, at the, the AII, to, to chair today's session. Thanks. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, and I would like to thank uh, this opportunity to invite a global audience right here to listen to Professor Mahesh Rangarajan for his lecture titled Empire, State and Nature, Richard Grove's Remarkable Legacy of Environmental History. Mahesh Rangarajan teaches history and environmental studies at Ashoka University, Sonipat, Haryana in India. He was educated in the universities of Delhi and Oxford and was a Rhodes Scholar. The demise of Professor Richard Grove in June 2020 brought to an untimely end a remarkable life. Even before the publication of his magnum opus, Green Imperialism, a quarter century ago, he had made a mark as a scholar with rare ability to synthesize across time, periods, continents, and disciplines. If the challenge of history writing is in linking the past and present with eye to the future, he was clearly a scholar that stood out. I would like to take this time to invite Mahesh to give his speech, but perhaps I also want to give a personal introduction outside of a paper introduction that says that Mahesh is a professor. He is one of India's leading thinker, uh, an intellectual uh, public voice in the realm of looking at citizenship and wildlife. Mahesh has been a visionary in teaching us as students and as young scholars to look at the environment, not only as people-centered, but as being-centered. And for me, as an anthropologist working in, in India, his work has spoken to me at various levels. His work as part of the Tiger Force in India and the Elephant Task Force has been a guiding light for many of us. Mahesh is always visible in the public sphere in India, but for me, at the heart of it, he's a teacher. He's a teacher that connects with students at every level, from high school to undergrad, at the level of research, to some of the world's most renowned historians. And yet I have seen him in public spaces and the way he connects with the audience. 
is both magnetic and humbling. This morning I was talking to a student in India and I said, Professor Mahesh Rangarajan is giving a talk at the Australia India Institute here in Melbourne. And the student said, oh, I know him. He's always sending us materials to read. And that is the power of a teacher, a visionary, and a public intellectual from India. And it is truly an honor to actually have Mahesh today to talk to us about the legacy of Professor Richard Grove. To give you all a run down of the program, we have Mahesh's lecture that will go on for 25 minutes. And we have Q&A session. Mahesh has agreed to take questions that you put on the chat box. Uh, Simon and I will be helping him in case he misses some of the important questions, but without much delay, Mahesh, such a pleasure and an honor to have you here at the Australia India Institute. The time is yours. Thank you, Dolly. Uh, very uh, embarrassing uh, introduction and uh, much of what you say about Richard is accurate and I think about me vastly exaggerated. But uh, it's a great privilege, uh, particularly because uh, this is a uh, the first memorial for Richard being hosted in Australia and in fitness, it's the place which gave him a very important post at the Australian National University. Uh, the first full chair he ever held. Uh, he had a very remarkable life which came to an end in June 2020. And uh, perhaps many of you know that he met with, a, with an accident late in 2006. And in these last 14 years, he fought a very brave battle. But his own direct intellectual productivity in a sense had come to an end. Those who visited him would regale us with stories of if they said a book he liked, he'd say thumbs up. And if they said a book he didn't agree with, there wouldn't be a sign, so to speak, a thumbs down. So Richard was a most, uh, Grove was a most remarkable scholar. And uh, as with any scholar, we have to locate him in the context of his times. Not just uh, the publication of his doctoral work in the form of a substantially expanded revised monograph, Green Imperialism which was brought out by Cambridge University Press in 1995. But one would want to go 10, 15 years earlier because I think the formative years of a scholar are particularly important. And as with any, uh, anyone who writes, not only with such clarity and energy, but also with great passion and a deep engagement with the subject and the times he wrote about, one cannot separate the persona from the man in this case, or the persona from the times. And the late 1980s and early 90s were a very climactic and important period in global history. They marked the end of the Cold War. They marked also a new time in the debates about the environment. 1989 was the year the Time magazine put the earth on its cover. And instead of a man of the year, an awfully sexist term, or person of the year, they decided to make it planet of the year. And it's uh, in the late 1980s that I happened to meet Richard Grove. I was a doctoral student. I met him, if I recall correctly, in my very first term, in the autumn of 1988. And in May 89, uh, along with some other students, he was the only person with a postdoc fellowship amongst us. We organized a day workshop and we had scholars of different countries and societies and periods looking at the relationship between imperialism, ecology, politics in a historical manner. This workshop itself was held, interestingly, just around the time of the Tiananmen Square Massacre. But that time, the late 80s, early 90s, were also important because of the large debates, both in India and China, on whether or not large dams ought to be built on the Yangtze Kiang in China, the Three Gorges Project, and in the case of India, the multiple dams on the River Narmada. So Grove's work actually came up in a certain specific context where there was rethinking, not only about ideas of justice, and freedom for peoples uh, across lines of class, race, or gender, but also in terms of justice across species, justice across generations. So the idea of the environment, which had been so important in the late 60s, early 70s, resurfaced in the late 80s, early 90s, with a new kind of urgency. There had been work on an ozone hole being found both in the North, you know, the North and the South Pole. There was fresh concern about global warming. And by 92, when Richard was well ensconced as a postdoctoral fellow at Clare College, uh, the uh, Rio conference uh, found a great divide between the United States and the rest of the world. This, in a sense, is a good place to begin because uh, uh, Richard Grove, as many of you may be aware, also had very illustrious parents, uh, Jean, uh, his mother, and his father, Professor A.T. Grove, still very much with us, were very well-known geographers. 
KG Grove's work on the historical geography of the Mediterranean was an important reminder that when we look at landscapes or at waterscapes, uh, the ocean, the land, uh, it, it has a long history and the history of human interfaces with the ecological systems is not merely one of denudation, destruction, deforestation. Uh, Grove was to be examined for his doctoral thesis, and I am getting ahead of my story, by the great and the late Christopher Allen Bailey. And uh, Grove would often recount uh, with great gusto how uh, Professor Bailey once came across him uh, get coming out of the library looking rather cheerful. And Bailey asked Grove, Richard, why are you looking so happy today? I thought you'd be really downcast. And Richard said, why? He said, you know, you're studying environmental history. It's all about extinction, degradation, collapse. And in a sense, I think it's very important to remember that Richard found an environmental history that was about more than just these things. It was also about how people examine the phenomena around them, come to have a new kind of understanding of this phenomena. And in the case of the surgeon botanists who became so central to his work, how they tried to set out and do something about it with varying degrees of success. So this interface between ideas and ecological change or the fact that scientific ideas may take the person from the world of sciences into the world of the humanities. It's something very brave to do today. We all believe in interdisciplinarity. But Grove was truly interdisciplinary, but he also studied people who predate the time, the late, the, the early 19th century, the late 18th century, they predate our age, when disciplines are much more boxed in and tend to be somewhat secluded in their own sort of cubby holes. So Richard Grove went on from uh, schooling in Cambridge to do a bachelor's in geography uh, at Hartford College in Oxford. He then uh, went to London University where he did a master's, interestingly, in conservation biology. His little read uh, early book, The Future of Forestry, actually looks at the ignorance of ecological principles in forestry in the British Isles. But for his doctoral work, he did something truly revolutionary. He uh, worked in Cambridge. Uh, his thesis was submitted. It was famously examined by two uh, very fine scholars, William Bynard, recently retired as Rhodes Professor from Oxford, and Chris Bailey comes back into our story, doesn't he? Richard being Richard, uh, this is his tailing, and I'm sure he'd, he'd have had a huge laugh if he was present with us in the flesh. Uh, I'm sure he's with us somewhere in the spirit. Uh, Richard Grove went in for the, uh, for the viva, and doctoral students kindly note, this is not being cited as something you should emulate. He went in for the viva one to one and a half hours late. And the reason he says is that a car splashed lots of uh, mud all over him. It had drained a lot. And he had to go and get freshly changed and get a gown because Oxford and Cambridge still have somewhat medieval customs and how you are to be dressed when you enter for a viva. The viva went off very well with one hit. Richard Grove's thesis was twice the permissible length. So instead of 85 or 80,000 words, it was twice that length. But he had read the 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 bylaws and the fine print and the regulations carefully, this extra verbiage or the extra words were buried in the footnotes. And it seems in Cambridge, you count the text without the footnotes. And of course, needless to say, he passed with flying colors. The Green imperialism, as the book was to be termed, was a fascinating book because it did two things. First, in the late 1980s, partly because of the great environmental history revolution in the United States, led by legendary figures, Donald Worcester, uh, William Cronin, Richard White, uh, Caroline Merchant. The United States uh, uh, historians of that time largely concentrated on American history. They showed how there were great debates in America's past, in the 19th, early 20th centuries, and ideas such as national parks, forest reservation for them, emerged out of America's engagement with its own troubles. The troubles not only in terms of justice for people, but also of justice with nature. Worcester was and remains famous for his book, Dust Bowl. The title is explanatory enough. And Cronin, of course, was famous for his book, Changes in the Land. Grove took the story and turned it on its head. Far from conservation, the idea that human interfaces with nature should be moderated with a view to the future, with a measurement of possible adverse outcomes of human agents, and with various regulatory systems, there is a big debate on where, uh, to mediate the relationships of nature, knowledge, and society, very loosely defined. These ideas of conservation for growth initially arose not in the United States, not even in Britain and France and Germany, which, by the way, had also been argued, 
continental European historians often pointed to the origins of forestry, particularly in Prussia, to a lesser extent in France, and later, of course, uh, in the British Empire. And Grove takes these ideas and turns them on their head. To do this, he had something remarkable in his army. In the old days, there was, a, there was an age, believe me, people younger than 25, there was an age before the internet, before you could get old journals at the click of, a, of the mouse, and you had to actually go and find them. And Grove discovered a remarkable secret of Cambridge. There were two floors full of old journals. And these journals, the journals of the Arbo, of the Horticulture Society of India, the Madras uh, Literary Gazette, the Madras Journal of Literature and Science, and several other such magazines and journals, in the early 19th century, he found, were full of articles and papers. Who was writing these papers? The group takes us to a moment when colonial expansion brought into Dutch, French, and British, pos British possession islands in the South Atlantic and in the Indian Ocean. Some of these islands are well known to us. St. Helena in the South Atlantic, where Napoleon would spend his lonely years of exile after his defeat at Waterloo. Uh, Mauritius and Reunion in the Indian Ocean, which were French and later British colonies. The Cape Colony, very important for Richard Crow, not an island, but it becomes like an island in its treatment, not only because of its floristic and faunal composition. The Cape, as you know, has a Mediterranean type climate. It is somewhat different from the rest of South and Southern Africa. But it also was the site of a very important botanic garden. And this is the second part of the story. Many of these island colonies had botanic gardens. There were botanic gardens very early on. This, of course, was a European tradition. There had been one in Padua from 1545, Oxford 1621. Richard, being Richard, found a remarkable book, The Garden of Eden, written interestingly by a former teacher of mine, John Prest of Balliol College. Simply put, this book argued that once Columbus discovered the Garden of Eden and Europeans came to this rather disappointing conclusion that the Garden of Eden did not exist, they, they decided to try and create a garden uh, where they could. They put lots of exotic plants into a place and model it like what they thought the Garden of Eden was. Well, Grove took Professor Prest's argument a step further. He looked at the Botanical Garden of Cape Town, 1694, of uh, the establishment of the uh, French uh, Botanical Garden in a place whose name I won't even try to pronounce in Mauritius. And most important, the British uh, or the English in St. Vincent, 1764. These botanical gardens had botanists in charge. And many of these botanists were men, there weren't any women, who spanned and synthesized several branches of knowledge. Some would be very fascinating. Robert Kidd in Kolkata would set out on the search for Dhaka cotton, which he thought would revolutionize the economy. This is a well-known story, the search for empire and the botanizing of empire. Empire was not only about aggrandizement, it could also be about improvement. And what better way to improve a colony than introducing new strains of crops, which would yield more rents, or more revenue, and better articles of trade and commerce. But there were others, Nathaniel Wallich, whom he would study, who grew over 27,000 species of plants in the same garden and managed to naturalize over 800 species of trees, some local, some from far away. While it's also ranged far and wide, he went to Nepal, to Burma, to Penang to collect various botanical specimens. What Grove does, however, is something very important. He shows that many of these islands, not Calcutta, but these islands, were subject to rapid environmental change. And in the very short span of time under colonial rule, market forces worked in such a way that systems of property worked in such a way that there were threats to the stability of agricultural production. Men such as John Coombe Brown, Crombie Brown in Southern Africa, South Africa, and Pierre Poivre in Mauritius were among those who drew links between the changes in land use and the changes in patterns of rainfall. They were not pioneers. In a subsequent work, Grove would do something very important. He would take the story backward in time. He would examine, for instance, how there were ideas of circulation of blood, Harvey, which were then applied to the circulation of water. So the water cycle becomes important. And St. Vincent, remember, St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the Caribbean, Grove would later show that it was here that some of the first modern regulations, I repeat, modern regulations were passed to protect forests, not for timber, not for hunting, these were age-old practices. They are not modern. They are not from the 18th, 19th century. 
but in order to ensure the stability of rainfall and water supply. So these regulations that come about in the Cape, in St. Helena, in Mauritius, in Reunion, in these various islands are a precursor to what we call modern conservation. And there's a very important reason, according to Joe, these ideas germinated, not only in these journals and the writings and letters of these men of science, but also made their way into policy. And here, he brings us a very important historical sociological insight. Such ideas could not be carried out into force in France, in Britain, for that matter, even in Holland, because there were powerful private interests. We all know that in each of these countries, there were large landed estates and landowners who were very important, particularly in the English case. And it was difficult for the Crown in Great Britain, for instance, to regulate and transform and change the behavior of these landowners. Those of you who have read Simon Sharma, whose book incidentally came out in 95, uh, the same year as Grove, Landscape and Memory, would recall that Sharma talks about the heart of British oak, how oak was a symbol not only of royalty and permanence, but also of patriotism, because the mighty British oaks that provided uh, uh, the ships uh, that the, uh, the British Navy used and the growing of oaks was to be encouraged, for instance, in the book Silva, which was published in the 17th century. Richard Grove argues that far from a search for timber, far from simply being about aggrandizement or strategy or commerce, these ideas of conservation were about the regulation of commerce. In a sense, they were an early instance of science tempering policy. These ideas, as he explains in Green Imperialism, were halting. They were not fully carried out. For that, there was a place, and it was a place the young Richard Grove had been visiting since the mid-80s. Around this time, 86, he met uh, uh, Vinita Damodaran, a doctoral student at Cambridge, a historian in her own right, now heads the Sussex Center for World and Environmental History. And as I'm sure your guests, they went on to be intellectual partners, and they also were married. But what is important for Grove is not just India as a place of fascination and due to his first linkages, but because his intellectual quest then led him to question what had been then the very important insight of scholars, among whom Professor Ramchandra Guha is clearly the most significant. So Guha in 89 writes a very important book. He takes on the foresters on self-glorification where they said, oh, British foresters came and saved the forest from shifting cultivators, peasants and artisans, and forestry is a great legacy of empire. And uh, Guha went on to show that this was not so. Much of the forestry was driven, for instance, in the late 19th century by the search for timber for the railways. And uh, foresters trained in India would go on uh, to work in over 50 countries, interestingly, including Australia, including in New South Wales, Melbourne, Sydney, and the hills around them. What Grove did is to take the story backward from Buha. He showed that uh, in the early 19th century, it was not just the reservation of peak in Malabar for timber, but these concerns about uh, denudation and the hydrological changes brought about by denudation that led to early imperial uh, to colonial forestry, not imperial but colonial in the 18 in 1847 and 56 respectively, uh, Bombay and then Madras would have conservators of forests. These were often men who had earlier headed botanical gardens. Watson in one case from the Dapuri Gardens, which are near Pune, and in the south, Hugh Francis Clegon. These are both very interesting figures, uh, and I think that one should emphasize a surgeon botanist like Cleghorn uh, was familiar with several Indian languages. Uh, his interest in botany led him to lobby for controls, not only on kumari or shifting cultivation, carried out not only by tribes, but in this particular part of Kurk, uh, also by non-tribal cultivators. He also wanted controls on the elite and the white planters. So what Grove comes up with is a very important idea if you were to reduce his complex and large body of work to one word which he made central, it would be desiccation. And yes, it's spelled with two C's, which I found out when I was writing, somebody corrected me and said, oh, you know, it's got two C's. Well, desiccation with two C's, not one for Grove uh, was important because he looked at writings like Donald Butter who said the desiccation of the land, the drying out of the land is comparable to a person falling ill. So the notion that there is a sickness of the land due to unwise land use, forest use, due to a variety of practices which have to be changed, becomes a part of the lexicon of the colonial uh, ruling elite. And uh, Dalhousie, as governor general in 1856, passes a minute uh, in which he talks about the importance of the forest survey. 
Green Imperialism's publication, of course, was a major breakthrough. And by then, Grobe was already well known. 1987, a year uh, around the same time as he was completing his doctorate, quite remarkable. He co-edited a very influential book, Conservation in Africa, Anderson and Grobe. And the subtitle is important. It says, Problems, People, Practice. And this is a very important book because it looks not only at the history of conservation in Africa, it looks, it problematizes it. Uh, it's important we are meeting uh, as uh, guests of a reputed institution in Melbourne. And we began with an acknowledgement of the peoples from whom this land was taken in a manner that was surely not justifiable or defensible. And I think it's important to note that Grow, uh, in his work, uh, uh, Conservation Africa, brought in several scholars who looked at African engagements with the land of how colonial critique and even modern conservation critique often does less than justice. It's a very important article in this book called The Overgrazing Controversy by Alan Rogers and Homewood. Uh, the Mursi and the Elephant Question, the Limbu's Forest of Kenya and what happened to it in the times of German and then British occupation uh, in the early 20th century. Grove, of course, was very particular that such works should not only be done by scholars based in Europe uh, and the United States and other developed countries. And in 1992, along with uh, Professor Deepak Kumar and Professor Satpal Sangwan, he organized a fascinating three-day conference um, on uh, the environmental history of South and Southeast Asia in Delhi. This was hosted at a very important institute, Nistads, published in 1998. Uh, it's a very fat book, uh, Nature and the Orient. I think it's 800 pages and the hardback weighs know, two and a half kilos. So the interesting thing is it brought together papers on South and Southeast Asia. It spanned the centuries. Uh, there were the Olchins, very great scholars of uh, uh, Northwestern India in its very ancient past, its archaeology and proto history. And they asked, was there deforestation in ancient times? It's a remarkable work by Tim Harper, which looked at debates about indigeneity in Malaya. Many years later, in 2006, uh, Grove, having held the postdoc at Clare, also having been uh, uh, in the agrarian studies program at Yale, uh, he had just been elected to this chair in Australia. He was one of the key organizers of an equally fascinating conference held at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. There had already been yet another conference at JNU. And these various conferences and proceedings have continued to be published after his demise. The last came out just before he passed away. There's a very moving photograph of him with it, uh, Commonwealth uh, Forestry and Environmental History. And uh, I think there's something to be said for the generosity, the mentorship, and the ability of growth to be an umbrella. The word umbrella species or flagship is often used to describe mega mammals like the elephant or the tiger or the panda or the bison. But it's very uh, commonplace. I'm sure you'd all agree and nobody will mistake me for saying this, that outstanding scholarship and mentorship do not so often go well together. But in Grove's case, they went well together. I'm quite aware of this because in 95, he more or less single-handedly uh, founded a journal which is still extant, Environment and History. And having been associated with the journal, I am happy to share with you that there were several young scholars whom he mentored. He virtually helped them rewrite their papers so that they could be considered for publication. And this notion of mentorship was particularly important to him in the African context. And also with those who were outside the metropolitan universities in India. We are all aware of this huge gaps of not so much skills, but resources, knowledge bases, availability, access to networks, which affects, therefore, the environmental debate and, of course, the historical debate. So Grove was someone who acted as a bridge across these different worlds. Most important, and I think we need to uh, make this perhaps the last point because we'll soon run out of time, was his attention to the global nature of environmental phenomena. There's a lot of work on the ecological phenomena which unify the world. And in the 90s, one word became very important, it's now much more widely known, El Nino, Spanish for the child, which refers to the changes in the temperatures of ocean currents of uh, the coast of Latin America in the Pacific. Well, in the late 90s, Grove co-authored a book uh, which looked at El Nino and it examined its impact over the centuries, not only on the ecologies, but its implications for socioeconomic, political, um, and cultural changes in South and Southeast Asia. Grove is a remarkable scholar. He had published in Nature, he had published in Scientific American. And in this sense, I think he was anticipating something we take for granted in our own age. When you look at a bookshelf today, you find Sunil Amrit writing about the Bay of Bengal, 
the fortunes of uh, uh, people who crossed the Bay of Bengal as labor, but also the importance of the Bay of Bengal as an ecological unit. We think of the work of Thomas Troutman, who looks at elephants and kings and the ways in which in the ancient world, 6th century BC, till around 150 years ago, war elephants were very critical in South and Southeast Asia, so critical that states invested in their protection, thereby perhaps facilitating their survival for strategic reasons. These books are commonplace today, but Grove existed in a time when these ideas were still germinating. And his work is important because it spans the ideas of metropole and colony, the idea that there were major breakthroughs in the metropolitan countries, which were then transposed and imposed on the rest of the world. There is no doubt that there was enormous coercion in the nature of colonialism. This was central to Richard's own argument. But there were also tensions at the heart of the colonial enterprise. Uh, it's significant that a few years ago, we lost uh, Grove's examiner, uh, the Cambridge examiner, uh, Chris Bailey, because Chris Bailey's three works, ending with reframing of the world, reframing the world in the 20th century, made broadly this point that there may be a parallel evolution across the world and we should perhaps not see the colonies simply as an experimental place for those going out from Europe, but look at them as entities in their own right. And in this sense, I think Grove drove us to consider the fact that we may be looking at a history that is interconnected in more ways than we may be prepared for. Second, and I think it's very important, a uh, somewhat neglected part of his work, was on patterns of resistance and on hidden voices. So the Hottest Malabarica is a very important Dutch text, uh, 12 volumes, by the way. You must look at it sometime just for the illustrations. And Grove, uh, in his 98th paper, showed that a lot of Hottest Malabarica is owed not only to its author, Von Rode, but also to the uh, 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 Irava botanists uh, who spoke Malayalam and several other languages who knew much more about the plants. So they were not just native informants, they were also involved in some way in the distillation and uh, preparation of knowledge, though of course as subordinate and unequal partners. One of his more neglected papers was on a colonial ecological hegemony and various forms of resistance. And this is a theme I'm sure he would have liked to develop. Unfortunately, the fates are not in our hands and one must acknowledge that these last 14 years were a time of uh, great difficulty, both for him and his family. And perhaps it is significant that his work is so powerful that this is perhaps uh, that, that it will it will long outlive them. Uh, scholarship, after all, is about the world of ideas. And speaking at uh, the elegy, delivering the elegy of the great Richard Cobb, uh, Maurice Keane uh, talked about Cobb having been someone who brought the voices of the submerged, the proletarian, uh, the Sokolo, uh, artisan, the peasantry, the women, to the forefront of history. I think Grove did that in another sense. He made these colonized peoples and ecologies central to history. And he also reminded us that history will not uh, be complete unless it engages with questions of the environment. To me, I'd end with a very interesting point that's always shocked me that the first paper on global warming, as we call it now, and Richard called it the Victorian Greenhouse Effect paper, was delivered in 1851, the British Association for the Advancement of Science. There were five authors. Three were from India, Forbes Royal, Strachey, and of course, Hugh Francis Clegon. Their voices were ignored, but the fact that Grove was able to find them reminds us that many of the battles we fight today, and the battles are as much of the mind, they're about the meanings that we give to life, to nature, to society, to the ideas of justice, of equity, that they have a past. So nature's pasts are still with us, and as we look at this somewhat uncertain, often troubled world, the work of someone like Richard Grove stands out remarkably both for its legacy, it's full of promise, and it's brimming with life. Thank you. Dolly, would you like to say something, or do you want me to take questions? Um, sorry. Uh, thank you, Mahesh. Thank you so much. I think, I think you should take questions, yes. We would love to see how you interact with the audience. Sure. Thank you. So I request people to type questions in the chat box and if I can read them out or acknowledge them, if I fall short, I'm sure Dolly will be happy to know. You do have privilege as chair of asking the first question, if you want to. <laughs> I, 
Mahesh, I, I will take the I will take the privilege as as you you point out. I am very um, in a way I think very um, interested to see how the the work that you focused on Richard Grove and his idea about mentoring and teaching and his ability to connect across regional universities and also the, the central hubs of universities. Um, can you tell us something about perhaps more about his engagement with, with regional colleges and institutions in India and how that shaped some of the engaging, I think, um, visible conversations. And I, I say that as somebody, of course, who works on Northeast, and I've seen you many times in Assam, in Shillong, across the Northeast, in some of the smallest colleges. And, and I, I see that that in itself, mentoring and the scholarship is such an important um, practice. And I see that in Richard Grove's life and also in your life, I would say that with, uh, with confidence. So can you share something about this? I think that, you know, this had a flip side. Grove was very particular about bringing in a, a range of people. He was very tireless. If he found someone interested in environmental history, he'd go and hunt them down. And, uh, you know, when, when you meet 10 people, all, all are not of equal potential. Uh, some have realized their potential. Some haven't realized it. Some are still scratching around trying to find a way. And he had remarkable patience. If you were interested and you shared his passion, his patience was endless. I think that's something remarkable must emphasize that, uh, and this of course has to do with the rather stuffy atmosphere, I'm happy to say it publicly, not just of Oxbridge, but of the emerging world of the university over the last 30 years. Universities have tended to become more professional, more bureaucratic, and if you like, more corporate. I think all three go together, though there are tensions between them. And Grove never fitted into these. He was famous. I've been an organizer of a seminar where, believe me, he turned up one hour late. And it, there, there was a very, very serious reason. There had been a family tragedy and he, had, he was delayed by that. He then proceeded to give a remarkable lecture. And he spoke for, you know, 90 minutes without notes. And when people went to tea, there were people who don't work on the subject who were still taking references and troubling him and sort of poking around an hour later. And I think this ability to be fascinated by what you do, but to be equally interested in others who have potential was remarkable. But he didn't get a teaching job. Uh, his... He, he was seen as someone who was, to quote the right word, eccentric. And a very great historian who should remain nameless once told his colleagues that whenever you think of Richard as eccentric, please remember, the university was originally created for people like him, not people like us. You're not in the university because you come in on time. Any, anyone in any office can do that. You're there because you are brimming with ideas. You have the energy to develop quality. And I think this ability to develop quality with the generosity of spirit for others and the ability and the, the drive to create platforms. So these various conferences he did, you go and look at the papers. Some of them fell off the map, but that didn't matter. What mattered is that the people who presented the papers managed to interact, to meet other people. And they went back richer and stronger. And you can never tell who has the potential to be a long distance runner. It's always full of surprises. We have Arup, and then I think we have quite a lot of questions for you. So, Mahesh, ah, go ahead. Right. I can't answer all the questions, but I, yes, there is, I think, Mira, who asks about Grove's analysis of native informants. Kapil Raj has critiqued it. How do you see the term? Guha and Gartkil questions colonialism as marker of the beginning of environmental history. Yes, of course, the issue of native informant is deeply problematic. I doubt anyone would disagree. And we also need to acknowledge and understand the difference between settler colonialisms, uh, South Africa, the Pied Noir in Algeria, the United States, Canada, or Australia, New Zealand, and uh, a colonial systems where it rested on the backs of a very large peasantry who did uh, have multiple forms of resistance, which we are over the last 50 years coming to know more about. So undoubtedly the term native informant is problematic and I doubt anyone would use it today. And I, start, I find even in your question, ma'am, you have used it within quotes. Did colonialism mark the beginning of environmental history? Obviously not. There are long histories. Uh, there are not only histories of the last 5,000 years, going back to the Indus civilization or the Harappan culture. There's also the longer history within the Holocene, 10 to 12,000 years. Agriculture, even rice cultivation goes back at least 8 to 12,000 years. And there's a longer proto-history. 
So human engagement with the environment are older, but did colonialism constitute a certain kind of watershed? Probably it did. And Goha Gadgil, of course, wrote a very important work in 1992, almost 30 years ago. And as time evolves, even their arguments get qualified, challenged, and uh, modified. And with new evidence, we will modify because that's the way knowledge evolves. Rajiv asks a good question. Can we look beyond the current universalist environmental Western narrative, which dominated environmental movements? If so, how can such efforts yield positive results as far as environmental protection is concerned? Dr. Rajiv, the second demands a separate lecture. I don't know how they can yield positive results. Positive results are, are possible, but it, it is an outcome which depends on so many other factors. There's no doubt that universalist Western narratives are under challenge today. Uh, all the challenges are not necessarily benign. The notion that an authoritarian one-party state can reconcile the human nature contradiction better than democracy is surely open to challenge. I, for one, would challenge it. But perhaps going well beyond that, uh, there's something very important ingrained in your question, which, to my mind, recent historians of South Asia, of various other parts of the world, have begun to emphasize that we do live in landscapes, we do engage with waterscapes, which have remained habitable and safe. I'm hesitant to use the word sustainable for long periods in time, centuries, decades, millennia. And we need to understand how that was so without romanticizing that. So in that sense, of course, one has to go beyond the universalist Western narrative. The Western narrative in any case is not universalist. If you see a very fine popular book, 1493 by Charles C. Mann, it's a remarkable man, he's a journalist, he sits and reads lots of books and he writes a gripping narrative. He shows the Americas after 1493 uh, are very different from what we thought. There, there's a range of ways of relating to the land. Many Indian cultures did survive, particularly south of the Rio Grande. Uh, many African-Americans, besides being slaves, also became freemen and women. And there is a range of ways in which uh, Hispanic, American Indian, African-American, and poor white traditions and systems of relating to nature or using the environment actually were very positive. Uh, one, I'm being very careful. We shouldn't romanticize them. But they don't fit this universalized Western narrative at all. And work like Gary Paul Nabhan, who looks at... Uh, uh, southwestern America and long grain systems of water and plant uh, harvesting uh, can be a very, very important uh, corrective. So that's, that's an excellent point. Mr. Rahman, very good question. The advent of oil plant plantations in the Northeast bound to have a huge uh, uh, impact on forest cover and biodiversity. Absolutely. The oil palm uh, is a very important marker. There's a very fine ecologist. Uh, Shankar Raman, who does something we'd all love to do for the last 30 years, he refused to take up a post in the Institute of Science, and he set up the Rainforest Restoration Center with another colleague, Divya Mudappa, and he has a very fine book at the heart of Wild India with an excellent essay on oil palm plantations, and the oil palm completely replaces a very complex uh, ecology, but one should remember India and South Asia in general is a huge consumer of oil palm. There's something called refined vegetable oil, dalda very important in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. And uh, believe it or not, much of the fat for the Dalda doesn't come from South Asia. It comes from Southeast Asia, the major market for Malay and Indonesian uh, oil plantations. So, you know, if the timber burger connection was important for the United States and destruction in Central America, the oil palm connection is very important in Southeast Asia. And Shankar Raman shows that oil palm plantations are today emerging as a very major threat in the Lushai Hills, where he did his field work as a, a doctoral student. Dolly, you're welcome. I'm trying to please, uh, Arup go on through and find this. Yes, I had a question on. Yes, please go. Yes. So yeah. <laughs> I haven't located him yet. So ah, Grove had drawn our attention to the world of science and the techniques and methods to empower the discipline of environmental history. Would you like to throw more light on that? I think that's a very good question, and uh, there's a lot of transformations in science over the last thirty odd years. To see the work of John Richards. Uh, John Richards has this remarkable book, The World Hunt, where he tells us about whaling, 1500 to 1800. And Richards draws on a lot of contemporary work on whale societies, whale sociology, whale communication, and how to estimate whale numbers. And this may be especially true uh, in uh, the work of archaeologists and archaeological anthropologists. The work which comes to my mind is Kathy Morrison. Morrison reminds us there's a long 3,000-year history of human use of the Indus, Ganga, 
uh, and the southern uh, river systems. And some phenomena we think of denudation, deforestation, soil erosion, overgrazing. They have counterparts earlier, but she also shows with the study of material remains that people also renatured landscapes and they kept them productive. So it was not all collapse. So definitely there needs to be much more of a dialogue of the humanistic sciences, including history, with the environmental sciences. And uh, this is not an easy dialogue uh, of Sasaikya's own work. The Unquiet River is the landmark because it uh, begins with the history of the Brahmaputra over the last several thousands of years. So we are in landscapes which have gone through large changes over time, and all of them were not human caused. And that also should create some sense of humility in those who study the modern period. I have, I'm in a department with uh, two, three very fine archeological historians and they keep saying, you know, you guys use the word pre-modern for centuries and millennia and should you not stop using it? And I think that's a fair comment. So I think the environmental sciences are very important for that among, among other things. Mahesh, there's a question about Aditya. I think you haven't taken that about groves inside as an activist in this. I'm trying to look for it because, ah, Aditya Ramesh, where are Groves insights as an activist in all this? Groves work is useful in thinking about climate, forests, and desiccation. It'd be lovely to see a resurgence in environmental history in Indian colleges. I know less of his uh, life as an activist than I should. He was very uh, active within uh, Britain. Uh, he had a deep attachment to the Wickham Woods. In fact, uh, Wickham Woods, of course, got protected because it was a scientific site. A uh, lot of the work on the badger, very famous book, Animal in, in British Lore, thanks to Beatrix Potter, was done in Wickham Woods. And uh, Richard was quite vocal about environmental changes in England, and he built links with a lot of activists. I don't think it's fair to call him directly an activist, but then changing the world is also about the world of ideas, and he was definitely connected with them. We have a question by Peter, and then we'll go to uh, Harit Priyarangan, uh, Professor yes, sure. Rangan, who wants to ask you a question in person. So after Peter, we'll sure. unmute you. Sure, I'm trying to find Peter. Peter McPhee, as a historian of France, my understanding of environmental history owes much to Richard's brilliant work on Pierre Poivre. I feel he neglected somewhat the deep popular knowledge among peasants of the impact, for instance, of deforestation. They do not always need to learn about the environment from their social betters. Uh, no, no question. And uh, my sense is that uh, Guha's work did that, but there's a range of other scholarship, uh, particularly in South Asia, which has done exactly that. I can think of many. And, uh, you know, Sanjukta's uh, uh, work on the Adivasis and the Raj on the Hose, uh, which Richard was familiar with. No question at all. But Richard was a, a historian with his particular niche. And I think he opened it up in a way very few people have. Uh, these ideas of peasant, artisan, herder, fisher, uh, centered, anthropologically informed histories actually have very wide currency. In fact, while we were, I was reading, I was reminded of two books I'm discussing now with students, Ajanta Subramanian's Shorelines, which looks at the Kanyakumari fishers and their ability to negotiate democratic spaces and the role of ecology in that. An equally important book by a recently celebrated and awarded historian, the young Anand Pandyan, Cultivating Virtue, where he looks at the Kalas and their transition from being a so-called criminal tribe to becoming rice cultivators. These are very particular, in fact, largely positive stories. There are several others with other outcomes. But I, I, I'd be with you. I think that peasant and producer knowledges, I'd use the word peasant in a broad sense, one could use it for people living on land and land. And perhaps for other kinds of producers, uh, the labor history is something we, we were not looking at earlier. And there's a book coming out by Anand Vaidya where he looks at Dalit Adivasi conceptions of the forest in which labor is very central. So he unpacks even the notion of the peasant. So I think, uh, Dr. McPhee, that's a very, very valid observation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Professor yeah. Rangan, had a question? Um, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Thanks so much, Mahesh and Dolly, for taking the question. Mahesh, wonderful talk. Um, I just wanted you to reflect on an interesting contradiction that Richard Grove raises in green, green imperialism. You know, you can almost not even notice it. But, um, but you see, uh, you pointed to the issue of, 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 of the colonial sort of doctor... Uh, conservationist people so looking at the islands as an issue of where you know um, 
there's a lot of degradation um, due to the um, due to the introduction of plantations um, for colonial profit. So they are um, they're simultaneously raising concerns about conservation. But one of the interesting contradictions that emerges is when because so much of contemporary biodiversity um, thinking is really drawn in this sort of metaphor of islands, mm. islands of biodiversity, whereas mm. islands, if you think about it, have always been places, hubs of exchange in, in some of these places, the Indian Ocean. So from my perspective as an Indian Ocean sort of environmental history person, I find it fascinating that that this this uh, this idea of conservation and biodiversity is always kind of somehow about conservation, you know, in, dominated by an island metaphor, mm. Mm. and that in reality, um, mm. people have moved around and, in a sense, you know, had to ha have transformed landscapes. So mm. conservation has this this baggage from that time, which actually makes, makes it quite difficult to do biodiversity with the dynamism of, of change and people and so on. Mm. So I was wondering your, what you thought about it. No, that's a very astute comment. In fact, uh, some years ago, a group of us had done a book called Shifting Ground, which critiqued this model of conservation arguing that the park space model, which has had important contributions, we are not arguing there shouldn't be parks, but that it ignores that parks cannot be secluded ecologically. So the movement of animals, birds, even plants, uh, the prevailing winds, water, pollutants, etc. We also argue that they cannot be secluded culturally and economically. Uh, there are peoples living within them, there are peoples who cross the borders and so on. But I think there's a deeper reason for this, which uh, I must say, it's a very, very, very astute question. If you see the work of a uh, very important book, you know, Song of the Dodo by Kwame, uh, it is the 70s and uh, late 60s that uh, MacArthur and Wilson really get going. And as we know, the MacArthur died young, God bless his soul, and Wilson is still very much with us in Harvard. And MacArthur and Wilson argued that you can calculate the decline of biodiversity by looking at an island. They famously did something, they, they killed all the insects on an island, kept counting how many insects were there. And they argued that if you halve the area, the proportion of species that vanishes is more than half. So this island theory of biogeography, the exact opposite of the Grove idea. For Grove, it is what you're saying. It's a place of confluence of ideas. And there is an attempt to moderate and mediate these changes. To be fair, these surgeon botanists, they were, they were working for the for the company quality. They were not saying wind up the company, go home, get rid of the plantation. They were trying to mediate these changes, right? But I think the MacArthur Wilson argument gives a very powerful scientific rationale for hands off parts, for more parts and larger parts. You know, there's the debate between the large and small parts in which their theory is naturally oriented towards the large parts. I'm not getting in whether they're right or wrong. I don't have the qualification. So I think it's a very astute observation and conservation by its very nature, uh, has over the times also got a conservative, uh, strong conservative dimension to the way it's practiced. And the notion that you can seclude an area, freeze it in time, appeals to those in power. And here you're giving a scientific rationale. I think Grove is slightly different, or rather the people he's studying are slightly different in one risk, with respect, if I may say so. They are arguing that this regulation is a matter of survival. You know, there was a paper of his he never published. I've only seen it. I, maybe it's there in his in his works. It's called Surgeons, Forests and Famine. Lovely title. Surgeons, Forests and Famine. Protect the forest to avoid famine. And the famine comes for a variety of reasons. But one of the reasons is that you didn't listen to the surgeons on the protection of the forest for the health of the land. So a notion that there is this larger interest of economic political stability and for priming the pump you need to do this, it's a physiocratic idea. I think there's a difference uh, today, and the difference really very starkly is that this conservation biology has become a very powerful force 
And unfortunately, much of conservation biology doesn't even begin to acknowledge uh, this fact of fluidity, both ecologically and socioculturally. I think it's begun, but I'm sure it's a minority view in that very important trial. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mahesh, and thank you to this wonderful audience uh, for coming and joining us at the Australia India Institute to honor the legacy of Richard Grove and to listen to Professor Mahesh Rangarajan's talk, what it means to be a mentor, what it means to be a visionary. And I would like to take this final opportunity, Mahesh, to thank you once again for for being the teacher, for being the thinker, and for being in our lives in a way to actually show us what it means to engage with a country like India, very diverse, both in terms of citizenship, but at the same time, if we open the diversity to other beings, the animal world, I think it'll take more than a lifetime to uncover. And I am very, very pleased that this was an excellent conversation I'm very happy that this is being recorded and we will put it up on the Australia India website so that students and researchers can continue to come back, listen to your lecture and also the interaction that you've had with the audience. So Mahesh, thank you very much. My yeah. privilege, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a really wonderful day in India. Thank you.